This is actually, it makes me feel a bit like being back at Occupy. Uh, some of you may have spent time in the camps, and some of you may have seen, in fact, how they conduct themselves. Uh, and one of the things they did is, uh, particularly the New York camp, they banned the use of megaphones. Therefore, they had to figure out a way to amplify their own voices. And so I'm going to ask us to participate in that, just to get a feel for what that's like. Uh, but I'm going to say, mic check, and then you're going to say, mic check back together. Are we ready? Mic check! Mic check! Mic check! Mic check! Mic check! Mic check! Mic check. You guys are good. <laughs> the other piece uh, is actually a beautiful way of showing uh, affirmation for what you're hearing. If any time the speakers were saying something that people uh, felt you know, they, they wanted to affirm, they would do this thing they called sparkle fingers. Some of you may have seen that as well. And it's a, a beautiful thing. It might have started, I think, in Spain. But uh, what happens, of course, is applause is, of course, also a beautiful thing. But often it can kind of disrupt the flow of the speaker. And so I, I want to just introduce that practice here for maybe the rest of the day. If anybody feels like they uh, are excited or affirmed with something said, to just give a little sparkle fingers. Okay. Jacket's coming off. So this talk is uh, The Revolution is Love, Lessons from Occupy. Uh, I want to invoke here where there's been talk of archetypes here today. And I think one of the core archetypes of the Occupy movement is embodied, of course, in the mask. Uh, Guy Fawkes, the revolutionary, who in really invokes, I think, today a, a spirit of the coyote, a spirit of the, the jester that comes in. And I think that really was part of the core uh, energy behind the movement. Next slide, please. So the word paradigm. My partner back home actually has this thing where any time I meet somebody new, she times me until I use the word paradigm. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, I love this word, but one of the ways we can translate it is uh, the core stories that underlie a culture. So what are the core stories that we use to see the world and, and the dreams that we dream? And I think that Today, with my own work, what I've uh, just really, I think, given myself in service to is finding these stories, or finding the stories of the emerging world, the world that wants to be born, and amplifying them in ways that uh, others can connect to and to see themselves in and be reflected in. And I think uh, Occupy itself was a, a beautiful example, I think, of uh, an uprising trying to express itself of this new world, this new, as Charles Eisenstein says, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Next slide, please. Speaking of Charles Eisenstein, uh, some of you may know his work, again, Sacred Economics, a short film uh, and, and a book, a brilliant book that actually lays out uh, how an economic system would look like if it was based on another story, a story of interbeing. And my uh, connection with Charles actually happened because after I read his book, Sacred Economics, he has a thing at the, at the end of it, he says, if you have surplus or, or capacity or extra resources, uh, what if you put them, what if you invested them in the more beautiful world? What would that look like? And for me, I was lying in bed, I put the book down and I said, I'm gonna email him right now. And so I emailed Charles and I said, can we talk on Skype? And it was a few days later and we, we talked on Skype and I said, Charles, I want to come out and make a film about sacred economics. I think there's something beautiful in it that needs to be shared. And he paused for a moment, and then he said, OK. And then he said, wait, i got to ask my wife. And, and ultimately, she said yes, too. And I ended up uh, out. This is uh, uh, when I asked him, actually, the Occupy movement had not happened yet. I was actually tracking a, a film uh, with another director, Velcro Ripper, at the time was called Evolve Love because it was really asking the question, uh, what would it look like if this underground movement of movements found each other? What would it look like uh, if we could see that we are all aligned in this world that wants to be born? And in the film, we, we didn't really have the expression of it yet. We had a lot of people, spiritual teachers and visionaries, kind of hinting at it, but we didn't have the expression until on September 17th, 2011, the Occupy movement erupted on the scene in New York. And suddenly, a few weeks later, 
based on our prior decision, me and Charles actually ended up standing in front of Wall Street. And there's this beautiful image in the film, Occupy Love, in an interview uh, where Velcro Ripper, the director, and he says, you know, we're standing in front of this thing that looks so solid. It's not so solid, is it? And Charles says, no. In his brilliant, succinct way. Uh, next slide, please. So this is me on Wall Street. I was able to visit a few times, uh, and I remember how just the, the beauty and the humanness that, that just felt so uh, unmediated. That's the word that, that came to mind. It was this beautiful flowering of just something that felt so true and so human. There's this fellow, uh, Malik Rasan of Occupy the Hood. He says it in the film that uh, he's like, it's this weird feeling. It's like, this is what humans are supposed to do. They're supposed to take care of each other. They're supposed to settle their differences in conversation. And what I saw there, next slide, was, was this beautiful connection between uh, what it meant to actively uh, express care for another, what it meant to, to kind of stick a step, take a step back from the stories that we've been told that governed our lives, uh, and were telling us that this is the best we could do. And instead they were saying, no, we can do better. And in fact, uh, the whole Occupy language, uh, while maybe initially felt a bit you know, inflammatory, this idea of the 99% versus the 1%, while it was initially, I think, uh, able to get a lot of people uh, acknowledging their own power, at the same time, those that really knew, knew that it was not a question of demonizing certain people, certain people in positions of power. What it was, in fact, was just recognizing that our challenges were systemic. That, in fact, if we just went in and removed, you know, those specific one percenters, the system would regenerate one percenters very quickly because that was the way that, uh, that was the dream that our culture was dreaming. Next slide. So I think, you know, where has Occupy gone since and what, were the, what has been the impact of Occupy? I think it's important to recognize, uh, I think, what it wasn't. Because when something like this happens, I mean, of course, the way we see, we want to see uh, what we think it is before we really allowed ourselves to understand uh, what it truly was and is. I want to read this quote. Uh, next slide, please. This is by a fellow Michael Mead, some of you may know. But he says, choose one side of a dilemma and the other side resurfaces with a vengeance. Choose one side and the conflict will return at a deeper level at a future time. Only when the tension of opposing forces can be held long enough does a genuine solution appear that can dissolve the tension and renew the flow of life at another level. This was the power of Occupy. It was actually, it's not about camping in a park, although, you know, it provided some iconic imagery. What it did was to create a, a piece of tension in the culture with which either people wanted to explain it away and say, oh, it's just a bunch of hippies in the park, you know, playing bongos, don't want to work. Or they would say there's these, you know, visionaries that are trying to bring about, uh, you know, an old communist regime or something that, that, again, the left, the classic left really wanted to kind of put into what they understood the movement to be. And it was only uh, three or four weeks into the movement when the Rolling Stone finally published an article where they said, aha, I think I know what this is. It, it was the first time anyone had ever gone on strike from their own culture, which is not the same as dropping out of the culture. It's taking a step back again and saying, what could we do if we sat down and acknowledged that we actually don't know what to do? What would it look like to sit and, and look at each other and see each other and say, like, how can we proceed together? The next slide, please. So there's this word, mind bomb. Uh, the Occupy movement itself was actually, it was not conjured, uh, but it was branded by a fellow, Kali Lassen, the founder of Adbusters magazine uh, in Vancouver, Canada, which is actually where I'm from. Uh, and he has this thing where he's obsessed with mind bombs. He's like, what's the next mind bomb? And Occupy was just one mind bomb of many. He's constantly throwing them out there, trying to see what sticks. And he was as surprised as anybody that Occupy took off as much as it did. Uh, and at the same time, what he's recognizing too is that uh, how we change the global consciousness uh, now is shifted. Because, I mean, I love the pictures of the neural network networks um, in the brain that we saw earlier. Because now, as well, for the first time, by mapping the internet itself, we're able to actually see a picture of, you could say, the, the consciousness of humanity itself, also known as the noosphere. 
And just as much as we're seeing, you know, funny cat videos in Gangnam Style zipping around the world to billions of views, uh, you could also look at that and say we're building the neural pathways with which uh, powerful new memes can be shared and catalyze big change. Next slide. Such as the noosphere. And I think at this particular moment in time, I mean, I, I look back on my own life as a, as a filmmaker, I have no doubt if I didn't choose this path, I probably would have gone into advertising. Hey. <laughs> And I, I recognize as well that the beautiful gifts that, that these storytellers have and the deep responsibility that storytellers of today have with uh, the tools and the ability to, to provoke change, that we need uh, a very conscious effort to craft and deploy very powerful memes into the noosphere to create the change we want to see. Next slide. This is the quote from Charles Eisenstein. This is something I believe was the core of the Occupy movement that really, I think, uh, was what people, even if they didn't have the language to say yet, this is what they actually resonated with. No one deserves to live in a world built upon the degradation of human beings, forests, waters, and the rest of our living planet. Speaking to our brethren on Wall Street, no one deserves to spend their lives playing with numbers while the world burns. Ultimately, we are protesting not only on behalf of the 99% left behind, but on behalf of the 1% as well. We have no enemies. We want everyone to wake up to the beauty of what we can create. Thank you, Sparkle Fingers. So, this is the time we're in. How do we wake up to this beauty? How do we enact this new culture of love? Next slide, please. If I could characterize it, I would say that we are coming out of an age of duality. And this is that idea of the, the tension between opposites. I think what we're asked is, uh, can we acknowledge and, and recognize uh, the, the polarities, the duality of the world that we're in, and yet at the same time don't succumb to the uh, oppositional forces of good and evil, black and white, left and right? I think that this is the time, as Charles says, uh, well, next slides, please. This is the space between stories, where certainly a lot of the tools are emerging. Uh, a lot of the, the fragments of this tapestry are starting to show themselves. But we don't know exactly what this new world will look like. And I think uh, this also asks us to come to a deep recognition that, as we don't know, we must consciously step into uncertainty. And that means that we must relinquish control. That means we must learn how to deeply surrender uh, to this world that wants to be born. But many of you have probably heard the term synchronicity. And for me, how I translate synchronicity is that on the one hand, we have this old story that says change only happens with force. That in fact, we must muster the amount of force uh, necessary to force those in power to change. And at the same time, I think we're starting to recognize that we're having moments in our lives that, that can't be explained. They can't be explained from an old story. I mean, even today, there was multiple examples of uh, pieces of this tapestry that showed themselves, whether the myth of Shambhala or the archetypal journey of the hero. All of these pieces are showing themselves uh, together, and I don't think it's an accident that they're, they're emerging now in this place. I think the question then becomes, uh, how do we surrender to that deeper intelligence? And in that, in that way, we actually enter a phase shift as a species. And you see this in the beautiful metaphor in our film, Occupy Love, of starlings over the, the land on a winter's night, where they move like this single collective organism. And yet at the same time, there's, no, there's nobody in charge of the organism. And yet it, it seems to flow beautifully and responsively to the conditions at hand. Next slide. So I want to leave you with three questions, as Samantha has asked me to do. And so here's some questions that you can ponder and take with you as you move forward. And you wonder, what does it mean to occupy? First question is to ask, well, what are your gifts? And if you're lucky enough to know, because many don't, uh, how can you cultivate those gifts at a deeper level. 
And the one thing to understand in the time we're in is that uh, often our economic system actually as it is will not value those gifts yet. And that doesn't mean though that they're not valuable. And in fact, we need an economic system that actually catches up and supports us in offering those gifts. Next slide. This then begs the question, well, how might I bow into service to this more beautiful world that wants to be born? Often, again, we don't know. We don't actually know. And yet, as we step into this place of surrender in cultivating our gifts, then we find those moments of uh, those aha, those moments of potential that want to express themselves to the point where you just start getting, you know, it's just uh, impossible to actually draw a linear connection between where this will take you. And I think, I mean, this is how I'm somehow standing here right now from uh, the moment of Skyping Charles and saying, hey, we should make a film about your book and where that has led me and then to here with meeting all of you. Next slide, please. And the final question is, what if you began today? What would that look like? I think as much as we certainly have this vision for the world that, that wants to be born, at the same time we recognize that uh, in many ways there is no such thing as the future. In fact, the way that we proceed now will determine whether or not that future is the one that is born. And so we must proceed with our hearts and our courage and our deep love for not just the ones that will come after us, but for those on, upon which shoulders that we stand on, the ones that came before you, the ones that thought you were a good idea, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here today. So I want to thank you all. And And like the beautiful final parting words of Occupy, at least its first incarnation, was that you cannot evict an idea whose time has come. Thank you.